Okay, did you get all that? You understand all that? No. No, good. I'd worry about you if you did. So by now, we've been working our way through uh, the book of Revelation here for several weeks. And by now, I'm sure if I were to pose the question to you, what is the main theme of the book of Revelation, you could tell me. And you would tell me something to the effect of, the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ revealing himself to us, his plan and his purpose. And so that's what we're trying to see as we go through here, is Jesus Christ, his plan and his purpose as he reveals it to us. But now he does that with a series of sub-themes. And one of the major sub-themes in the book of Revelation uh, is a subject that uh, God has been dealing with me with for quite a while and pressing upon me that it's, it needs to be have a place of great importance in our lives, especially in our corporate worship lives, and that is the theme of worship. How we worship, uh, when we worship, uh, all those questions, they're revealed to us here in this book of Revelation. But the thing about Revelation is, as Brian read, I, I hope you could kind of let your imaginations uh, wander as he read along for us. And if you did, you would notice that it is just full of scenes of wonderful, mystical characters. And I, I was thinking of the, the things they can do with special effects now at the movies. If they could, you could depict this scene, uh, how, how it would look. I think it would be a marvelous thing to behold. All of these uh, creatures, uh, great and small, and they're all busy doing uh, wonderful things. And it's just hard to imagine. And that brings us to the problem that we've talked about over and over again when we enter into the book of Revelation. We want to try to nail everything down. We want to try to identify everything and relate it to something that's going on in the world right now. Now we know that the whole book relates to the things that are going on right now, things that were going on then, and things that will be going on in the future. But when we get so focused on the details, we often miss the big picture. Uh, you remember earlier on I, I quoted from uh, Dr. Dennis Johnson's uh, commentary on Revelation and he said this, he said, an abundance of detail can confuse rather than clarify if we lack the sense of the bigger picture. See? An abundance of detail can confuse rather than clarify if we lack a sense of the bigger picture. And what happens is because of our Western minds, and there's nothing wrong with Western minds, with Western civilization, the greatest civilization the world has ever known, but because of them, we are detail-oriented and we, we tend to abhor mysticism. We tend to stand back from the mystical. But Revelation is full of the mystical. And there are things in there that I don't think God ever intended us to nail down in every minute detail. He wants us to get the big picture. If we focus, for instance, on the creatures in chapter 4 here where Brian just read from us, if, if our mission is to identify these creatures and try to figure out you know, where they are uh, in our world today, we lose sight of the bigger picture. And what is the bigger picture in Revelation chapter 4? What's the number one thing God is trying to convey to us in this fourth chapter of the book of Revelation? He is worthy of worship and his creatures are to be about the business of worshiping him. And we are his creatures. So what's our job? We should be worshiping our great God who was and is and is to come. You notice that phrase is repeated all through the book, all the time. Who was and is and is to come. He's emphasizing his eternity. Revelation, we need to remember also, is not to show us what Jesus looks like, but what Jesus is like. 
And oftentimes, remember, we get caught up in trying to identify what he looks like or what a creature looks like, and we miss what he is like. See, in, in the mystical and the, the picturesque way that God wrote this book, he depicts Jesus as a lamb, right? We'll get to where it actually says that. So Jesus must look like a lamb. But, whoa, well, wait a minute. Just a little further over from that, he says no, Jesus is a lion. Oh, well, he must look like a lion. Well, we know that's silly, don't we? But we get all caught up in trying to see what things look like. But the book of Revelation is trying to show us what he is like. And he is like a lion, isn't he? And he is like a lamb, isn't he? At the same time. And we'll talk about that a little more when we get there. This book is a bunch of symbols in motion. And these symbols are moving with a purpose to a conclusion. And we know what the conclusion of the book is, don't we? Heaven comes down. God's kingdom is finished. And we have a part of it. And all of these other things, all of these wonderful, mystical, beautiful things are just there to propel us and carry us to that end. You remember that this book was written to real churches in real time who were going through real struggles and real persecution. Churches today, same thing, real struggles, real persecution. Remember that the churches weren't all that good either, were they? They all had their problems. Churches today, same thing. Churches a thousand years from now, if the Lord tarries, will be in the same place. And so we need to know the end of this book because when we're struggling and thrashing about and we're in the midst of turmoil, Satan may be attacking us. It just may be we're uh, suffering the, the effects of a fallen world. But we need to know that in the end, God's kingdom is not thwarted. God's kingdom is victorious. And we, as a part of God's kingdom, therefore, are victorious also. So let's take a look and see just what's going on here. And the first thing we need to understand, you have to start here, is the way into the throne room. Because that's what God's doing in this fourth chapter. He's ushering us into his throne room. So here's a question for you. Can a non-believer worship God? The answer should be obvious. No. They can go through the motions. They can sing the songs. They can wave their hands. They can jump up and down. They can do whatever it is uh, you, how you want to define worship. But they can't worship God because worship comes from the heart. It comes from a relationship with God. See, you can make the motions, but you cannot worship. So the first step in worshiping is you have to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. True worship requires relationship. Now remember, God looks on the heart. He doesn't look at the motions. You can wave your hands around all you want. If you don't have it in your heart, it's not worship. It's just waving your hands around. You can sing the most beautiful praise choruses in the world, and if you don't have Christ in your heart, it's just beautiful singing, but it's not worship, you see. So the first thing we see, you, you remember, Jesus made it plain to the, the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He seeks worshipers who can worship him. How? In spirit and in truth. In other words, relationship and knowledge. They both go together. So the first thing we see is, here in verse 1, let me read it for you again. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. That's huge. The first thing we see is the open door and a heavenly calling. An open door and a heavenly calling. 
There was no way John could have forced that door open himself. There was no hope for John to get through that door unless someone opened it for him. And Jesus Christ opened that door for him. And it's the same with us. There's no hope of us getting into God's kingdom unless Jesus opens the door and invites us in. Yeah. That's the first criteria to, to becoming a worshiper. An open door and a heavenly calling. John summons to enter into God's presence. And back up a little bit, the church of Philadelphia. Here's how Jesus, here's what Jesus says to them. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. You see? And, and you go back to the Gospel of John, and we see Jesus depicting himself as the door. I am the door, he says. The way into the throne room of God is through the open door of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit provides that heavenly calling. The Father decreed. The Spirit calls. Jesus opens the door. And we enter into God's presence. It's awesome. And that's the privilege we have, you and I, His creatures. See, we get all enamored with the creatures in the book because they're mystical and magical. But we're the creatures. Right here. And some of you are pretty mystical. And some of you are, well, I would say strange rather than magical. And you'd probably say the same thing about me. You'd say, ah, oh, you're just weird. But we're God's creatures. And we're to worship Him. Whether we're mystical, magical, strange, or outright weird. We're to worship our Creator who was and is and is forever. Who must have an invitation. And then you can enter. But it gets even better. Look at verse 2. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Notice that the call and the open door, as soon as the call is issued, the result is immediate. Immediately, he entered the throne room. That's a, that's a wonderful privilege we have. When the Holy Spirit calls us and we go through that door, we are immediately in the presence with God. And from then on, we can enter any time we want. You know, in Hebrews it tells us that as His creatures, we can come, how? Boldly before the throne of grace. Now, it doesn't mean presumptuously. It doesn't, it doesn't mean uh, we can just show up any way we want, but we can come boldly. It means that we can have the confidence that we can enter into God's presence and ask Him anything we want or tell Him anything we need to tell Him. Confess anything we need to confess to Him. And what does it say will happen when we do? We will receive grace and mercy according to the need of the moment. Isn't that huge? Now, think of the picture we have here of God. He's on this throne and all this stuff's going on and probably thunder and lightning and uh, creatures bowing down. And that's the God that we can go boldly before and say, I have a need. Or I have a problem. And know that he's not going to strike us dead with a bolt of lightning. But he's going to dispense grace and mercy. That's awesome. That's awesome. Unrestricted access into the throne room of God. Now John attempts to describe for us what he sees. And that's about all it is is a good attempt. Because it's heavenly. And he's trying to describe the heavenly using earthly words. And it's, it's, it's hard to do. So he says here in verses 3 through 7, Brian read for us, and all of those things, here's what I want us to see. <clears throat> Brian mentioned several different kinds of gemstones. Well, 
Is God a bunch of gemstones? No. What's he trying to convey to us? He's trying to convey to us that God is beautiful beyond description. So he uses the, the, the best words he can find to say to us, God is so beautiful, God is so magnificent, that our words fail us. And it should not surprise us that human language would be unable to accurately describe the great living God. I had a professor one time who was fond of saying, it doesn't surprise me that God is so big that I cannot understand him. What would surprise me and disappoint me is if God were so simple that I could. Okay. And that's, that's great. That's a good saying. So, so what do we have here beyond God is beautiful? Okay, we've got that. Now we've got uh, 24 elders hanging out here. We've got seven lamps. We've got a sea of crystal going on. What's all this about? We have the fullness of things. Well, I don't know that we need to identify the 24 elders. If you read the commentaries, depending on which one you read, they represent this or they represent that or they represent something else. You know, you can take your pick. But maybe, just maybe what the seven elders represent is the wisdom of the ages. And they're surrounding the throne. They're in close proximity to God. And because they're in close proximity to God and they're focused on Him, they have become wise. You want to be wise? Get close to God. You want to get close to God? Read this book. The wisdom of the ages is in here. And you know the great thing about the wisdom of the ages? The thing about this that's different than scientific knowledge? This was, and is, and is to come. This is eternal. This will never change. It's one thing about science, and I like science, don't get me wrong. But you, ever, you notice it always changes? Yeah. Because it's always wrong. Because it never has all the information. Now that's not a, that's not a cut on science, that's just a fact. Every time they find out something new, they have to go back and change all this stuff. So if you want to be truly wise, know what's in this book. The more you know about the book, the more you will understand the author. Seven lamps. Seven lamps most likely point to the fullness of the Spirit's presence. The Spirit is there with God. And when we are full of the Spirit, we are much more like God. Well, what about the crystal sea? In, in verse 6 it says, And before the throne there, were, there was, as it were, a sea of glass. Hmm. Or a sea of glass like crystal. Now, remember, we look, we, we've learned to look for key words. It doesn't say the sea is glass or the sea is crystal. It says the sea, as it were, is like glass or crystal. Hmm. What could that possibly be trying to tell us? Here's what I think. The heavenly sea, so tranquil, it seems to be glass. Now, think about this. Last time you went to the coast, what did the sea look like? Turmoil. It's constant in, out, in, out. The sun comes up, the moon comes up, the sea comes in, the sea goes out. Constantly, if the sea ever stopped moving, we got a problem, don't we? But not so with the sea that he sees. It's smooth as glass. He used to have a friend, he moved off to Idaho, and we water skied together. And we'd get up, we were really stupid, we'd get up 4.30 in the morning, go over here in the dark, launch the boat in the dark over here at Lackamas Lake, sit out there and drink coffee until it got light enough just barely light enough to see so that we could ski while that lake was like glass. And I'll tell you, for about an hour, you had the best water skiing you ever had in your life. It was just 
fantastic. And I think that's what God's trying to tell us here. He says, come on. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be peaceful. See? Turmoil, that was a good word. You get a gold star for that word. We trade turmoil for peace when we enter God's presence. Now, isn't, isn't it interesting because we're awestruck. We've got all this stuff going on around us. You've got creatures and ah, ah, And yet in the midst of all that, we have this tranquil sea, this inner peace about us. To be with God is to be awestruck. But it is also to be perfectly at peace. You remember now, this book written to these seven churches. It's interesting to me. These seven churches were in turmoil, right? Some of them were first, were firsting. That's a good word. Were facing the actual physical persecution. But look how, look how the book begins in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, what? Grace and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. He changed the order a little bit. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ. So even though we may be experiencing turmoil in our lives, we can have peace. Okay. I think maybe this is what Paul was talking in Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 where he says he has the peace that passes all understanding. You know? Because you can be in all kinds of crisis. You can be unhappy. You can be uncomfortable. You can be unsettled. But you can still have that inner peace that says, I know God's got it all in the hand. His plan is unfolding. And I'm marching toward this beautiful end of the book. To be with him forever in that wonderful place we call heaven. The heavenly sea. Well, what about four living creatures? Let, let me pick it up here in, in uh, verse 6. And before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. Whoa. Again, I like to think of a good special effects movie. Can you imagine what they could come up with for these creatures? I'd like to see it. It'd be cool. But again, we're going to miss the point if we focus on well, why did they have eyes all around? And why do they have eyes inside of them? Kind of weird. You know? Well, it can get weirder. You want, to, you want to see these creatures described by other people? Uh, go over to Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah peeks into God's throne room. You'll find a description of creatures around the throne. You go over to Ezekiel chapters 1 and chapters 10. Ezekiel gets to peek into heaven. You'll find descriptions of these creatures. Now, each description is a little different, as you would expect. People observe different things. Yeah, but they're all weird. They're just because they're heavenly. Okay? Not because they represent helicopters or something, but because they're heavenly. And they're there. I think what's important about these four living creatures has nothing to do with their identity. I don't think it has anything to do with how many eyes, ears, noses, legs, whatever it is they had. I don't think it has anything to do with the fact they've got wheels and all that going on. What is important about these creatures is not how they look, but what they're doing. Now internalize that one, creatures. Because what's important about you also isn't how you look, which is good news for me, and you know. It's what you're doing. That's what's important about you. Now we all want to look our best and try to look nice and all that. But that's not the important thing because God looks where? On the inside. The important thing is what we are doing. 
what we are doing. So let's just summarize for a minute before we move to what these creatures are doing. John could not possibly have entered the throne room of God had not the Holy Spirit called him and Jesus opened the door. Second, when we truly see God for who he is, we are awestruck. We are awestruck. So now let's see what happens. What are these creatures doing? Verse 8, the end of it here. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created what are they doing they are worshiping the one who sits on the throne what are you doing are you worshiping the one who sits on the throne you know one of the worst things we ever did in church is have a worship leader now let me finish and a worship portion of the service because we bifurcated the thing and we've set the song part okay that's the worship part and then we'll have the preaching and that's another part and having coffee together that's another part Do you know what that's all worship the preaching of God's Word is an act of worship hearing God's Word is an act of worship Fellowshipping with God's creatures is an act of worship. Our whole lives need to be reflected as acts of worship. Now, our worship will manifest itself differently in different venues, obviously. But it's all an act of worship. Worship is what the creatures are doing. Worshiping is what all of God's creatures should be doing. And notice the focus of worship. It begins with who God is. What do they say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Their focus is on the holiness of God first. Holy, holy, holy. Ah! And what did Jesus say? in Matthew 6 verse 9 when the apostles came to him and they said teach us how to pray and he says you pray like this our father who art in heaven focuses on the one on the throne what hallowed be your name our first crack out of the box when we enter the throne room should be to recognize the high holiness of God and I'll tell you something I think and, and I'm just coming around to this. This is kind of new thinking for me. Uh, but I think in our desire to make Christianity more palatable, to make Christianity more uh, simple, uh, we've lost something. We've lost that awe. We've lost that knowledge of the holy, if you will, as one of the great authors called it. And we just kind of come before God any way we want, whenever we want, however we want, without any thought to the fact that we're entering the presence of the great holy God. Now, I'm not talking about outside stuff. I'm talking about inner attitude. Okay? You can worship God in Levi's just as well as you can worship God in a three-piece suit. We're not talking about outside talking about inside we need to regain that awe in that knowledge of the holy the second thing they notice is they recognize him as almighty he's sovereign he does whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it with whomever he wants to do it with 
because he is the sovereign. Now, people don't like that. We say, oh, wait a minute. I want to have some say in this thing. Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, I think captures this idea. And you remember when we started out, we said you can't understand, you, just like you can't understand a portion of Revelation without getting a handle on the big picture, but you can't understand the book of Revelation without having some idea of what precedes it in the Bible. So here's, here's how Daniel states this. Well, he's telling the story. Now, this is Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king, the most powerful person in the land. And Nebuchadnezzar had sort of uh, slighted God, so God had struck him dumb. Now, here's what he says in verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And I love this next part. Underline it in your Bibles. My reason returned. <laughs> When you have true reason, true wisdom, true insight into the throne room of God, you understand that's where your focus should be. Okay, and that's what he's saying now. He says, my reason returned, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored, here's a familiar phrase, him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as what? Nothing. That's you and I. We're counted as nothing <coughs> compared to God. Now, we are his magnum opus of creation. So on the one hand, we are the greatest in his created realm. But compared to him, we're nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? <coughs> Pretty cool, I think. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 9 verse 20. He says, who are you, O man? to answer back to God. Wow. Wow. I think that's great stuff. God is sovereign and he does what he wants. Now what's the good news about that? The good news for you about that, he sovereignly chose each and every one of you to be, come through that door and into his kingdom. And since he is sovereign, and you read John chapter 6, Read it a few times. Read it over and over and over until you get it. All that the Father gives me will come to me and all that come to, of all that come to me I will lose nothing. You read Romans chapter 8. What can take you out, separate you from the love of God? And he goes through this huge laundry list that covers every possible thing you can imagine. The answer is nothing. That's good news. <coughs> Especially if you're a faulty creature like me. Because I mess it up all the time. And I ha yet I have the confidence to know God's word tells me I'm not kept by my works or my faith or my grace or my anything. It's all of God. That's huge. And if he wasn't sovereign, you couldn't depend on it. Okay? Then we see his eternity. He doesn't take care of us for just a while, but he will always be there. So he is sovereign, he is eternal. Now, while the creatures are extolling God's praises, and that's what they're doing, they're vocally praising God, we see another response uh, from, the, from the elders. Theirs is a little different. Verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, and here we go again, worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. 
overcome by the realization of God's holiness, they literally fall down before him as an act of submission. They take their crowns and cast them down at his feet as an act of total submission to him. Have you ever done that? I hope so. And I'm not talking literally here, but it's, maybe you did literally. Most of us don't wear a crown, so we can't do that literally. But you know, again, we, we look at Paul in Romans 12. What does he say? I urge you, brethren, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, what? As living sacrifices. See? As living sacrifices to God. And that's what these guys are doing. They're literally falling down. And in recognition of his total authority they, and their submission, they cast their crowns. Both the elders and the creatures are in God's perfect present, now get this, yet express their praise and their worship differently. The creatures are, are verbalizing. The elders are, are, are doing things with their bodies. They're, they're prostrating themselves and so on and so forth. You know what? That's okay. It's okay to express ourselves differently because we're different people. Some of us are more emotional than others. Some of us are pretty stoic. Ronald Barclay Allen, professor of mine over at Western Baptist Seminary, wrote a book years ago called Praise a Matter of Life and Breath. And at the time, and I wouldn't be surprised if he isn't still, he's one of the foremost authorities on Hebrew, Old Testament, and especially the Psalms of our time. So he was pretty, pretty expert in the, in the area of worship. And he told a story about a time he was in Alaska, and he was uh, teaching in uh, some Bible college up there, and he was teaching on praise and how the Hebrews praised and that. And he noticed that uh, his audience didn't seem to be quite getting it. They, they looked rather bored with the whole thing. So uh, afterwards, uh, he asked one of the people there at the school, what, what was the deal? And they said, well, uh, native Alaskans, Eskimos, are stoic people. And he processed that and it dawned on him that if he had, and, and, and maybe you can kind of visualize this, if he had a Hebrew and an Eskimo sitting next to one another, now you all, you've seen enough television and news to see what the Middle Eastern folks are like. I mean, geez, they just go off and go nuts at the drop of a hat. Well, so you'd have this Hebrew over here probably flailing about with his hands and praising God and this Eskimo sitting there kind of like this. But they'd both be worshiping if as long as it was coming from their heart. You see, that's different. But it's not one any better than the other because it's coming from their heart. We used to have a gal here at this church years ago. They moved off to Seattle, I believe. And she always sat right over there. And sometimes during the song service, She'd just get up and she'd come up here and get down on her knees and pray. Now, I, I would probably never do that. I, I don't like to say never, but it's probably just not the way I would express myself. But I noticed her and it was a beautiful thing when she did it. She didn't disrupt anybody else. She didn't, you know, there's no big, hey, look at me thing. That was the way she worshipped. And that was really cool. You yeah. know? So it's okay to be a little different. Your outward expression will be judged by the genuineness of your heart. Okay? So you can be an Eskimo or you can be a Hebrew. God's good with it all. As long as your heart is right. So what about us? What does all this mean for us? I realize sometimes, especially in difficult circumstances, it is difficult to offer praise. It's just tough sometimes. We don't feel like it. What does God say when we don't feel like worshiping? Worship anyway. There are times when we're not going to feel like forgiving one another. What does God say? Is forgive. 
There are times when we're not going to feel like extending grace to one another. What does God say? Be gracious one to another. You see, our attitude of praise and worship shouldn't come from what, how we feel. How we feel should come from our attitude of praise and worship. At these times when we don't feel like praising God, we need to understand we do not live in a perfect world. Bad things do happen to good people. People hurt our feelings. Things happen. But in those times, yes, recognize we don't live in a perfect world, but we do serve a perfect God. And He is worthy of our praise at all times. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor. I, I love the, the Holy Spirit and the way He works, and so I'm working on this sermon, and I get this thing into my email, and it was about one thing, and over here was a little side box, and it said something about worship. So I clicked on it, and, and here's this guy. His name's Carl Lentz. I'd never heard of Carl Lentz before. Now he's the pastor of Hillsong Church in New York City. And it was, it was short, I don't know, five, six minutes, but it was powerful message on worship. Now just to show you that I will learn from anybody. I, I got a lot out of Carl Lentz's message. <clears throat> now Carl Lentz's nickname is the Pentecostal Powerhouse. He rants and raves and goes off speaking in tongues and does all this stuff that I would never do. But I was able to learn from him. And he said one thing that just really gripped me. And it was this. He said, your praise should always be greater than your preferences. Your praise should always be greater than your preferences. You know, we all have preferences. We all tend to gravitate over here or over there. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But we should never let our preferences inhibit our praise. You see. Never let our preferences inhibit our praise. Too often we have it backwards. Our praise is based on our preferences or on how we feel. Psalm 34 verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David. But what's the setting? What's the situation? 1 Samuel chapter 21. David is being pursued by Saul and Saul's army. They want to kill him. And David's done nothing wrong. And David is in the, the, the act of acting like a fool before King Abimelech so he can get out of there with his life. And in that situation, in that setting, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Wow. You think he felt like praising God? I doubt it. He's trying to save his life here. But he did praise God. You see, we tend to think sometimes that our, the value of our praise and our worship is based on how we feel. No. It's based on our heart attitude, but our heart attitude can be totally different than how we feel. We tend to equate the two as one. They're not one. When we come into this place, we are entering into God's presence. We, uh, I just happened to be in ministry at the right time to kind of go from the transition of this place being the sanctuary to this place being the auditorium. And I think it's time it went back to being the sanctuary. You see? There is a difference. We went through a period of time where, okay, we want to build a church, but we want it to look like a strip mall. Or maybe we don't want a building at all, we just want to rent someplace. We don't want it to look like a church. 
I had one person tell me when we remodeled in here, well, don't put that big cross up there because it might offend somebody. Wow. Yeah, well, good. Let them be. I, think, I think we have actually done the cause of Christianity a disservice by playing down the very things that represent Christianity. And I think, you know, the big deal is, and, and I'm probably wrong, but the big deal is, you know, the reason young people are leaving the church is because they don't like church. I don't think so. I think maybe the reason the young people are leaving the church is because in so many ways it's not church anymore. I could be wrong. But I don't know. We have forgotten how to be contempl contemplative. We have forgotten the value sometimes of our Christian heritage. I think Dr. Allen was right when he titled his book, Praise, A Matter of Life and Breath. Because without that, it doesn't matter what we have. And I think young people can figure that out. We can have all the stuff we want that's supposed to resonate with them. But if we don't ever usher them into the throne room of God... They have other options. Let me give you an assignment. This week, read, this isn't that long, but read Psalm 144 all the way through Psalm 150. They're short. It's not a big assignment. And they're all about praise. They're all about worship. And uh, you'll be uplifted by doing that. I promise you. It will be a good exercise for you. So, Revelation chapter 4 is about by God's grace he's ushered us into his throne room, given us unrestricted access forever. Wow. It's pretty cool. I think I can praise him for that. I can worship him for that. Let's see what happens in chapter 5. Lord, thank you. So much for being the God who was and is and is forevermore. Thank you for being sovereign. Thank you for being able to do whatever you want to do. Lord, because that's the way I can have confidence, we can have confidence that we are yours forevermore. That regardless of what happens in our lives, we have access to your throne. In chapter 3, you, you described it as a door whom no one can shut. Once that door is open for us, it's open for eternity. And we can enter into your presence anytime we desire. So Lord, help us to understand a little bit about worship. Help us to heed the words of Carl Lentz. Don't allow us to let our preferences become larger than our praise. Let us focus on you, O oh God, and worship you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It'll change our lives by your grace. Amen.